from Playmates. Hey, what's up? You gotta talk about Turtles again? Because we're on the wave two of the vintage Playmates Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy line. We're talking Crane, Casey Jones, Baxter Stockman, some of the major characters who were sort of secondary characters. All right, we're gonna start with the villains this time in wave two because we get some very important characters with the villains. Uh, we get more important characters with the villains than we do for the heroes. So, kicking it off, the most important villain we got. Yep, we're gonna start with Krang. When people look back at this toy line, a lot of people wonder why Krang wasn't in the first set. And yeah, it's a valid question. Why wasn't he? But I guess the, the cartoon, would, you know, was just really a season and a half in. I mean, Krang was already established as a, as a villain. They obviously knew he was going to be a main villain, but I guess they wanted the focus to not be taken away from Shredder early on as the, as the big bad. Krang has probably the most unique action figure in the entire line. He's this weird little, like, finger puppet. Like, he's just a hollow ball with a hole on the bottom. Like, you could stick your finger in and actually use him as a finger puppet. He has articulated tentacles, but that's it. He's just kind of, he's he's basically what you would usually get as like a pack-in buddy accessory character for a bigger action figure. So how did they get away with selling this accessory character at full price? Well, for one, he's fully painted. Every vein on him is painted. His eyes are painted, his teeth. They put just about as much paint as you could on such a simple figure. But what they really packed in to make it a worthwhile purchase was he got what they call his bubble walker, which is a sort of body that he walks around in with a glass shield covering him and it has sort of weird mechanical chicken legs. He used it a lot in the cartoon before he got Krang's new body, which was the android body that everyone's more familiar with. For the action figure, it's not the greatest. The execution's a little awkward. Even though they put this hole on the bottom of Krang, they didn't make a peg on the seat that he can be fastened on, so he just kind of hovers on the seat there. Now with my version, I no longer have the clear bubble that goes over him and protects him, so he can fall off very easily. Actually, when I did rebuy this toy, it had the clear plastic bubble on it. It was a little yellowed. But when I first got these toys back in 2006, I was uh, very shortly out of high school. I was very young. I was going through a really, really idiotic phase at that time where, you know, I just kind of treated everything like garbage. And it was like too, I was too cool to care about anything. If you cared too much about something, you were a dork or something. So I was like rough with them. I didn't really care if they got damaged and stuff. So it, it broke at that time when I had it and I've just never replaced it ever since then. But aside from that, the, the walker is kind of awkward because they have these arms that you stick on and the arms have no articulation inside of them. They're just these stiff arms that are always jutting forward. And you can just plug them onto these pegs on the side and they don't stay very well. They pop off very easily. If you try to turn them while they're on, they'll most definitely pop off. And he has this really long gun that you have to put in one of the hands and it just kind of weighs the figure forward. And It's a really awkward figure. You're supposed to plug this, this cord into the gun and it doesn't really hold very well. As a kid, I lost every part of the Bubble Walker very early on. Like almost immediately all I had was Krang because the arms never stayed on and I just, it was more work to put it together and try to keep it together than it was to just play with Krang as the brain. All I really wanted was the character. I didn't really care about all the weird chunky gray pieces of broken plastic he came with. So it's kind of an awkward figure, but I was the one who got Krang. I believe I got him for Christmas? I got him at some point. I don't remember exactly when I got him, but I do remember getting Krang myself. And I, I mentioned earlier how we would do this thing where we would, much later on, when we were getting out of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, me and my brother would rip their, their heads off and legs off and call them like, oh, this is bowling ball raff or something. And we'd throw them at a bunch of figures standing at the end of a hallway and try to knock them over. 
the, the term we made a bowling ball actually came from Crane, because he was the first one I did that to. I ripped his arms off and called him Bowling Ball Crane. And I would, like, chuck him down the hallway and try to knock other figures over with him. Later on, they added Crane's android body. You could get it, and it was giant. I remember my brother got that. And I haven't been able to get that back. I had it as a kid, but I just haven't been able to get it back. It's really hard to find one today that actually has all the stickers intact and the accessories intact. And like, it's not missing pieces or damaged in some way. Uh, I'd really like to get that back, though, because that's really the best way to display Krang. And I know much later in the line, they released an android body that was roughly the size of the other figures. I never had that. That was around a time where I wasn't really collecting turtles anymore. But the large android body is the way to go. That's the, I wish I had that. But yeah, Krang in general was not the greatest figure, but he was necessary, and it was good to get him. Next up we have Baxter Stockman. Baxter Stockman is a classic Ninja Turtles character. He goes as far back as, I believe the second issue it was of the Mirage comics. I don't remember, it's been a while since I read them, but I believe it's the second one that opens up where he's showing off the Mausers and April O'Neil is working with him. But thanks to the 1987 cartoon series, Baxter Stockman's character was taken further and mutated into a fly. He became one of the first supporting, recurring villains in the series that wasn't part of the main team. Baxter Stockman actually played a larger role as a human in the cartoon show. He was in almost all of season two. He's Shredder's main underling. He's very involved in the story. And I'd, for some reason I forgot about that as a kid. I always remembered it until I watched the show again when I got older, like in like 2007 or so. I always remembered it where he was introduced in an episode at the beginning as a human, and by the end of the episode, he became the fly. And I was dead wrong about that. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the history of Baxter Stockman. We're here to talk about the action figure. This is another one of those figures I actually held onto for a very long time, like Rocksteady. Though I know early on, or not too early on, but by the end, we didn't have the wings and the extra arms anymore. Baxter Stockman was clearly designed at a point where they didn't quite know how they wanted to do the mutant. He has, like, human hands that aren't colored like his body. And they, they don't really do that too much later on in the line. The only other character I can think of who has that is Scumbug, who's a very similar character. I've even heard rumors that he was supposed to be a new Baxter Stockman figure at some point in production, but they just changed him into a whole new cockroach character. I don't even know if that's true. I heard that years ago. But anyway, Baxter Stockman is a pretty awesome figure. He's kind of weird looking. The little smile he has in the mouth is kind of awkward. Like, I don't really know what's going on in the mouth area. It doesn't look like a, a fly mouth, and the colors are just kind of weird. And they also kind of gave him hair that makes him look like IQ from the Burger King Kids Club. But you know, in general, he looks pretty cool. The ripped up lab coat is pretty awesome. His feet are just so monstrous and creepy looking. He has that really gross look. He's one of the first really gross Turtles toys where that became very popular later in the line where, where characters just look totally gross and that was awesome. That's what we loved back then. But yeah, he was one of the first ones like that. I mean, he's clearly inspired by the film, The Fly. I'd say the original and the remake in the 80s. The original in that his face is very similar to the face of the fly in the original film with Vincent Price. But I think his body, the way they made all that kind of gross, fleshy, veiny kind of detail on his body, is clearly inspired by the Cronenberg remake with Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis in the 80s. He's an odd character in that he only comes with really one accessory. It has two pieces, but once you put it together, it just makes sort of a, this mechanical fly swatter device. And I always found it to be a missed opportunity that he didn't come with a little Mauser. Like, he's so, he's always been well known for the Mausers, even as far back as his first creation in the comics. He's always been associated with his creation, the Mausers. But for some reason, he didn't come with one. I think that's a real missed opportunity. That's like an obvious 
accessory to pack in with him. Later on, they made the uh, Wacky Walking Mauser, which was like this giant Mauser that was kind of a wind-up toy that would walk. It was part of the Wacky Action Turtles set. But it was always weird, because that's not a normal Mauser. Normally, the Mausers are tiny. You know, they're like up to, up to the turtle's knees or so. So it was kind of weird to only get a giant Mauser in the original toy set and never get a normal-sized Mauser, especially not with Baxter Stockman. That would have been perfect. But yeah, he's a very cool figure, and definitely a very nostalgic figure. Not any, like, real specific memories pop into mind with him, but definitely one that, you know, I just saw a lot as a kid and ended up playing with a lot. Next up is the Rat King. The Rat King was a figure that's actually pretty cool looking, but as a kid I wasn't too interested in it. Me and my brother had a thing where like, we said human characters were usually boring. For some reason as kids we only liked monsters and demons and mutants and stuff. There was always exceptions, like you know Casey Jones was cool and stuff, but for the most part we said that humans were lame, they were boring. And, um, for some reason I just thought the Rat King was kind of like, what's cool about him? He's just like some weird, dirty guy. He's just a human. I don't know, I thought he was boring. But I didn't hate him, I just kind of like didn't really care about the figure. Because, I mean, you had like, all these other crazy figures in the set, and then you have just a guy in rags. So as a kid I didn't really like it that much. But looking back on it, it's actually a pretty awesome figure. I actually do like it a lot. The belt is a little, a bit much. It's just like really bright orange and just really big and clumpy and covers the figure a lot. I think a belt is a nice touch, but I just think it's, there's a bit too much going on. It's kind of funny that, you know, the guy who loves rats and like, you know, represents the rats of New York City would be wearing a roadkill cat as like, sort of like a trophy or something <laughs> like, you know, like a victory flag, but the belt could probably be toned down a lot. My copy of this figure, as you can see, also is damaged because there was a point in 2006 when I was first getting these back, I was going through a dumb phase, you know, me and my brother were just goofing off a lot and stuff, and there was one night where he just kind of started trying to turn everything that's supposed to be black on the figures black and everything that was supposed to be white on the figures white. But he didn't use paint, he used white out and black sharpie. And so that black sharpie got all over all the figures for years when they were in the drawer they were in. They all got smeared with black. And uh, the white out just looks horrible. It actually really did like ruin the value of a lot of these figures. So now some of these mice are not supposed to be white on him. But yeah, as a kid, Rat King was cool, but again, he was my brother's figure. Most of them early on were. Yeah, there's not a terrible amount to say about the Rat King. Just cool figure, cool design. I like how you can see that the rats have been like eating his hair and he just looks creepy. He has like, like missing teeth. He has these bright red eyes. He's he almost looks like a zombie. Like he looks really creepy. Again, like Baxter Stockman, he's one of the early examples of gross-out figures in the line. And then next we have Leatherhead. Leatherhead, I think, is one of the most disappointing figures in the entire line. For me, personally. Because you watch the cartoon show. Leatherhead is an alligator. He's enormous, naturally. I mean, he's an alligator. He towers over the turtles. He's a big dude, you know, he's built, he's ferocious. But then we get the action figure, and he's like the shortest character in the entire line. Like, he looks like a baby compared to everybody. Why is he so small? I get what they were trying to go for. They were trying to, you know, mimic what a real alligator looks like, where they're longer than they are tall. But it just doesn't work. In the packaging, they the artwork displays him as being enormous. In the back of the package, describes him as being super big, like giant. Like, I forget how long they say he is, but it's really long. And you look at the figure and it's like, well, this doesn't reflect that at all. He's this tiny little thing. Even his arms and legs are like really stubby and short. 
It's one of those weird instances like Splinter where they randomly decided to add more of the animal anatomy than they probably should have. Because in the cartoon show, he's again, he's much more anthropomorphic. And then he has this weird hinge at his jaw where you can pop the top of his head off. So many people ended up with headless leatherheads in their collections. I do like the Cajun motif, though. I always liked Leatherhead having the Cajun motif, because I was introduced to Leatherhead through the cartoon and the action figures, and he always had that. He was always a villain, and he was always a Cajun. You know, you'd always have, like, the cool hat, and the sort of straw jacket and everything, and the swamp boots, and, you know, he'd have a crawfish that he caught dangling off his belt. I always liked that. He had that cool voice that Jim Cummings did his voice. But I understand when he was introduced in the comics originally, he was actually not a bad guy and he wasn't a Cajun. That was made up for the cartoon. But I find that much more boring when he's just a big naked alligator man. Because in every version he's come back in, like the 2003 series and the 2012 series, they always make him, again, not a bad guy. And he's always just kind of a big buff naked alligator man. And he doesn't really have, at least in the 2012 series, he's a likable character, but he's not the most memorable personality-wise. I just think it's kind of boring. I feel like that Cajun style made him a lot more interesting, I think. It made him pop as a character much more. And it made sense. You know, he's a Florida Gator. He's from the South, so I get what they were going for. And he was a good, like, foil for the punk frogs. Like, he was the villain for the punk frogs, which we'll get to soon. But anyway, I do remember my first day with the Leatherhead figure. My family and I used to travel to, we used to vacation to Ocean City, Maryland each June as, like, our big vacation. That was, like, our big spending weekend. Like, we get to go out for a week. And we go to Ocean City, Maryland. Stay in this cool little, like, you know, townhouse hotel kind of thing you could rent. And it had, like, a nice little pool you could walk to in the back. And everyone who stayed there could go to the pool. I actually remember I first saw the uh, He-Man and She-Ra special. The one where they crossed over. That was, like, the first four episodes of She-Ra put together. Uh, I first saw it there, actually. But anyway, so, yeah, one summer we were there. And... Before we got back to the townhouse, we had stopped at a store and my father bought me and my brother Leatherhead. Like we both had Leatherhead figures. We went to the pool right afterwards and we took him into the pool. Like we both took our Leatherheads into the pool to play with them, especially since it was like, ooh, and we have an alligator character, so it's perfect. He's supposed to be in the water. So we were like playing with them in the water. And you know, I had my, I had my swimmies on. I must have been like four, maybe. Maybe not even, maybe, yeah, probably about, I think I was about four, maybe turning four in like a month. Yeah, I had my little neon orange swimmies on, and I was playing with my leather head in the shallow water. And then, yeah, there was a, the filter on the pool, you know, like an in-ground pool, it has like the little filters, the little flap that kind of goes down and goes up and, you know, well, filters the water. And I believe I put him in there when I was playing with him. Like, I was like, okay, this is like the room he's going to hide in and he's going to attack the turtles when they come by. And somehow I ended up losing him and we just never saw him again. And luckily we had the other one. We had my brother's. I don't remember if it was my brother's or if it was mine that got lost. But one of us lost Leatherhead in that pool. And it just became this kind of like legend for us for years to come. It was like... I wonder what happened to that Leatherhead. I wonder if some kid ended up getting him. Or we'd even like sometimes wonder, like, I wonder if he's still in that pool. I wonder if he's lost all his color. I didn't get that he was cast in like green plastic back then. I thought like, oh, he must have got so corroded that he's just back to like the white plastic base. I didn't get that like not everything was made out of a white plastic. I didn't know how any of it worked back then. So I just assumed that like the paint must have, you know, come off of him and everything. And. Uh, we just had all these crazy theories about what might have happened to that long lost leather head that we had. And uh, it kind of added like this this level of like fun to the toy that other figures didn't didn't always have. But uh, also both of those, I think we lost all of their accessories in the first day. Like that happened a lot back then. We'd have like the accessories, like the weapons and the belts and stuff. We'd have them for like maybe an hour or a day or a week. And then at some point, we'd just leave them on the carpet, and they'd probably just get thrown out by my mom when she finds them or something. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not huge on the Leatherhead figure. 
it's pretty disappointing, especially when you see him in the cartoon. But I do have some interesting memories of the Leatherhead figure. Another one of the awesome figures in the second wave of Turtles was Metalhead. But to be honest, I'm not usually a huge fan of properties having the negative version of the main character. Like, oh, you know, here's the robo version of the main character, or here's the dark version, shadow version of the main character. Like, I usually find that pretty lame. Even when they work to make a story that's actually acceptable and try to give individuality and depth to the character, if anything, that even makes it worse, because it's like, well, then why do they have to just be a recycled concept physically? But every now and then there's a cool one. Sometimes they pull it off with the Robo stuff, like Metal Sonic is awesome, and Metalhead is awesome. Metalhead is interesting because he's not directly a robot version of any of the one turtles. He's just a generalization. He's just a robotic ninja turtle. He uses totally different weapons from the turtles. He uses, like, he shoots his arms off and uses all kinds of built-in gadgets. You know, like helicopter blades and, well, you know, it's the kind of stuff, I don't know, Inspector Gadget used, basically. But his design is just really cool and creative. He has this very angular, sort of sharp design. He has all this intricate little circuitry on him and little boards and it's just really cool. He has this cool effect too. It's this weird thing where you look in the back, it looks like he has like a brain that you can see in, which I always found kind of odd. Why the hell would he have a brain? He's a robot. But they needed to make some sort of translucent red material in the middle of his head. They needed something on the back that was large and open so that if you put him in front of a light bulb, say there's like a light source somewhere and you put this figure's back to it, it will look like the eyes are glowing up on the front. And that's a very cool effect if it gives him like a Terminator kind of look. <laughs> Alright, gotta pause things for a second, just to let you know, I never knew what vac metal was when I was a kid. I just called it shiny, cool metal looking effect on toys. I learned what it was in very recent years, and apparently I didn't fully learn what it was because I thought it was back metal with a B. But it's actually vac metal with a V, like Mr. Vink with a V, V, V. So, I recorded this before I knew that. So just to let you know, in this video, I'm going to keep saying back metal like an idiot. And now that I know that it's vac and not back, that actually makes a lot more sense because back metal made no sense whatsoever. So, excuse me. But the thing I found coolest about Metalhead was the back metal on him. Now, back metal is, for people who don't know, the term used to describe this high gloss sort of finish they add to action figures sometimes. It's very metallic look where it's extremely shiny. It's usually done with gold and silver. Um, it's just like, you know, shiny all over. It's insane shine. Some people really hate back metal because they say it rubs off. It can like, you know, scrape off and just kind of leave black underneath it sometimes or whatever color was beneath it. But I personally loved back metal as a kid. I couldn't stop looking at it. I would just move the figure around and just look at all the different shines that would dance all around the figure when you did that. It was just so appealing. Like you felt like a bird seeing a shiny object. You just couldn't stop looking at it and in awe. <laughs> like, it was just awesome. I love the way that looks. I'm always, always down for back metal on figures when necessary. Metalhead was actually mine. I got Metalhead, I don't remember when I got him or for what reason, but I was the one who got Metalhead, and I really like this figure. I think it's really cool. He's not the most interesting character because he's not much of a character. In fact, he's not even a he, it's just an it, it's just a machine. And in the cartoon, he was designed to be a villain to stop the turtles, but then Donatello like reprogrammed him and repurposed him into like a maid bot, like basically uh, Rosie from the Jetsons, <laughs> just clean the sewer layer. Which isn't a bad idea, I mean, you live in a sewer, you gotta keep that place clean. No one was cleaning before, so I guess that's useful. But he wasn't the most interesting character, but he was just an awesome action figure. And I really liked this one as a kid. 
Over time, I actually completely forgot he had another action feature outside of the glowing eyes, where you were actually intended to pop off his hand and put some of the accessories in his wrist, so you could he could have like a weapon for a hand. And I, I always forgot that. I always thought that every copy of Metalhead that I have is like, oh man, the, the hand is busted, it's broken. Not remembering that, oh, that was actually intended. You were supposed to take the hand off. I know this figure is one of the earliest ones I obtained, personally. I remember getting him. I still had not moved into, like, the new house. We still lived in the townhouse at the time when I got him. So it was, it was like, 1989 when I got this figure, I believe. I have very old memories of this figure. Probably the last of the villains that we actually got from this set. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe the last villain that we obtained was General Trag. And my brother got him for his birthday one year. Uh, early on, it was uh, it was still the, probably 89 or 90 that we got him. But General Trag was a cool figure, he was a menacing figure. And I do remember liking him a lot as a kid. I liked that he was like covered in animals, there was like these mean looking lizards all over him, and scorpions and spiders, and it was just really cool to look at all the detail they crafted into this figure. This was one of the first cases where like they really showed off just how cool they could make the sculpts. You know, you have all these sort of craters on him with, you know, uh, some lava coming out of it, and there's some magma coming out of him, and just all these jagged piles of spikes on him and rock. Again, he just has all these like creatures that go bump in the night crawling around on him and stuff. He has cobwebs built on his body. It's like, it's just a very cool figure. It really shows you what they could do. And later on, they would get even crazier with that. And um, I do remember liking this figure quite a bit. The thing that was always weird about General Trag, though, is at least in the years that I watched the cartoon, which is basically from the first season all the way to like 1993, I believe is when I watched the cartoon. I don't recall General Trag ever really serving much of a purpose. He was always regarded like he was an important villain, like he was a main character. Like, you know, oh, he's the number one guy under Crane when it comes to the Dimension X army. You know, he's the, the leader of the Rock Soldiers. But he really never did anything. He would kind of just appear on screen and talk to Krang every now and then and give him updates or take orders from him. He was never really much of a character. And I'm pretty sure that the toy package just explained him as being a dumb brute. Like, just talked about how stupid he was. How he was a brainless idiot. Then there was also Lieutenant Granitor in the show, who, even though he was in the cartoon pretty much just as much as General Drag, or close to as much as General Drag, and even appeared as a boss in one of the video games that General Drag did, you know, the original arcade game on NES, they never made a figure for Lieutenant Granitor, which was kind of weird. It would have been cool to have Granitor and Drag. Drag also looked drastically different from the cartoon in the toy. But to be honest, I kind of like the toy design more. It has more variety, it has more personality. The cartoon one, he's kind of just like this all reddish kind of rock, and his face doesn't really express any kind of emotion. Whereas the toy, he looks really angry. He looks like an angry drill sergeant, so. I like the action figure better, honestly. And I like the, the different colored stone that's all over him. He has like the gray granite, and then he has like the brown, muddy kind of rock, and it just, it looks really cool, the variety of colors. Now for the heroes in set two. We're gonna start with Casey Jones because, you know, he's one of the main characters in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. After the Turtles, April O'Neil, Splinter, and Shredder, I'd say in the grand scheme of the entire franchise, Casey Jones is probably the most important next character. Even more so than Baxter Stockman, I'd say. It is odd that in the 1987 cartoon, and which had sort of a shared universe with the toy line. Not really, but, you know, it was, they were promoting each other, and that whole era, that era of Turtles, pre-1990 movie and post-Mirage comic debut, it is kind of weird that Casey Jones was portrayed as a much more minor character and as just this really, like, insane dude. He was just this maniac he never took his mask off ever. There was even an episode where he goes undercover for the turtles because he's one of the only humans they know. So he goes undercover in some building as a worker, but he's like wearing the hockey mask the whole time he's working there. And he's just, he's just crazy. Like he can't even be reasoned with. 
He's just this madman vigilante who's just always accusing everyone of being criminal scum and just like, just wants to lay a beating on everybody who does anything remotely wrong. He's just a maniac in the cartoon show. And that's sort of the, the look they went with for the toy. The toy is definitely color scheme wise and mostly outfit wise based on the cartoon show version of him, pretty much to a T. But sort of the build and the way they did his hair is definitely in line with the original comic. The way they have the, sort of the weird blue highlight on the black hair. Because, you know, a lot of times in comics, like in the, you know, superhero suits like Batman and Catwoman and stuff, they'll highlight the black suits with blue. It just looks nice. Blue's sort of a neutral color. And, you know, it's a, it's a nice way of avoiding always using, you know, gray as a highlight on blue. Black. So it was kind of cool that they gave him this comic booky sort of shading effect in his hair. Even though as a kid it kind of confused me. I also didn't notice as a kid that the red was straps holding his mask on. I just thought he had all kinds of crazy hair colors. Like he was like Rufio or something. Like he just has all this weird hair dye in his spiky hair. But I got this guy for my birthday one year, I believe. I got him and I believe I also got Slash the same. He was one of the later figures I got for the second wave, even though he's probably the first one a lot of people got. I like this figure. I thought he was cool as a kid. You know, the fact that he wore the hockey mask all the time kind of made him seem a little less human. As I said, for some reason, my brother and I had this thing where we didn't like human characters usually. We said they looked like dorky. <laughs> I don't know. But the fact that he always wore the hockey mask kind of made him cooler than most other human characters, so it kind of gave him a pass. But even then, I didn't like him quite as much as, you know, a lot of the other characters, a lot of the mutant characters and stuff. I do think the figure is a little awkwardly designed, and when you put the duffel bag on him to carry his weapons, because, you know, he comes with all kinds of weapons. I love the color. The color is very nostalgic for me. It really takes me back to, you know, when I first moved into my new house, that birthday when I got this guy. But he, when you put all the weapons in the duffel bag and put it around his shoulder on his back, it's pretty much impossible to make him stand. You have to have him, like, bending over like he's an old man. It's really a design flaw. It really stinks. He's a little too lightweight and skinny and stickly. Even though, I mean, look at him, he's ripped. But as far as action figures go, he's very skinny. And that duffel bag actually weighs quite a lot. And it just doesn't really work. So that is a problem with the figure. Also, you can see mine, the wrist is popping off on one arm. It hasn't come out, but it's just, like, messed up. But, yeah, Casey Jones is cool. He's definitely an awesome character. But the figure's cool, but it's not one of the best of this wave. Still a good one, though. Ace Duck is one of the cases early on, one of the first cases we got of a character who appears in the toy line, but isn't really in the cartoon. Sure, he does appear for a brief second in one episode, but he's a character in a TV show that the Turtles are watching. So he's a fictional character within the show. He's not even meant to be a mutant. He's like an animal mascot character. But in the toy line, you're like, screw it. He's a mutant and he's an ally of the Turtles. Why not? And he's a cool figure. He's one of the rare figures in the line that has these ball joints uh, for his arms. And they have these metal ball bearings in them. I think the only other figure that had that may have been Tattoo. I can't think of exactly at the moment. There might have been one or two others. But I think it was just Tattoo and Ace Duck. Ace Duck is also different because early on in the line, there was a lot more figures that had different body builds, as I was saying before. And where later in the line, most characters had a generally human build and were very beefed up and all kind of had like a wrestler body. In the early waves, they tried a lot of different builds for characters. And honestly, most of the characters were not ultra beefed up. That became more common later on. And Ace Duck was not really beefed up at all. He was actually rather skinny. He had this cool pilot motif going on. You know, this, this cool jacket, this bomber jacket, and he had this neat hat he could wear and everything, and he came with this belt that had egg grenades they could drop on him. Now, I don't have the eggs anymore because, you know, sometimes these figures just came with such tiny accessories that people just lost them all the time. It's actually very hard to find an Ace Duck figure that actually still has the eggs intact. But uh, Ace Duck was cool, honestly. I remember we got him very early. He brings me back to being very, very young. Uh, Ace Duck and Genghis Frog, who we'll get to next, they remind me of being very young. 
Ace Duck was my brother's. Genghis Frog was, I believe, mine, actually. I don't remember. Maybe he was my brother's. I actually don't remember. I know we got Ace Duck and Genghis Frog at the same time. And uh, the only thing that was always kind of weird about Ace Duck, when you really think about it, or really any character who's a bird or a bat who has... You know, they're anthropomorphic and they have legs and they have human arms, but then they also have wings on their back. They technically have four arms, if you think about it, because a bird and a bat, their hands are basically their wings. I mean, it's not entirely a hand, but it's like the replacement of a hand. They have fingers and everything in there, pretty much. So they basically have like six limbs when you really think about it. Just kind of weird. Ace Duck has six limbs. He also technically has like two tails, kind of, because it almost looks like he has a tail at the bottom of his wings, but then he has a duck tail on the back. And he has a duck tail haircut. Three duck tails. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? And no, I'm not going to sing the theme song. Genghis Frog was a cool figure. Now, I don't remember who got him, if my brother got him, or if I got him, or it might even be one of those cases where we both got him, actually. We both got a copy of him. Because I remember playing with him a lot, actually. Like, my brother had Ace Duck, and I played with Genghis Frog a lot. I believe we got them at Christmas, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it was the Christmas, you know, after I got Leonardo for my birthday in the summer. I do remember having Yings Frog for a long time. And I do believe, actually, earlier I was telling the story about Leatherhead in the pool. I do believe we had Genghis Frog in the pool as well when all that happened in Maryland. Because we would just bring our duffel bag of Ninja Turtles with us on vacation a lot of times. Or we'd bring, like, two or three. I think this was before the duffel bag. So this was, like, my parents would be like, oh, you can bring, like, two figures that you really like and we'd bring him on vacation with us. And I do believe I brought Genghis Frog on vacation with me at that time, so. My Genghis Frog did some tra uh, traveling. He went to Maryland, and then later on when we were, we had the duffel bag and we could bring it to Vermont, where my grandparents lived. We'd visit them in July. I brought him to Vermont too, so that uh, Genghis Frog got around. He, he went all over, well, not all over America, but he saw, he saw a decent amount of America, probably more than most action figures do. I always like the color scheme on him. It's kind of simple and weird, but I like it. I like the uh, the bright yellow and sort of magenta or whatever you want to call it kind of kind of shorts that he has. He has this cool like you know beach bum kind of look to him, and I just always like the colors. Like it was it was a weird combination of colors with like the sky blue and the yellow and the magenta and the sort of lime green on him. It created this very cool like summery kind of feel. Then he even came with shades and everything. I actually had to rub the black ink off this. As I said before, there was a point when I was older in 2006 where my brother put Sharpie all over all the things that were supposed to be black on figures. So he did that on the sunglasses for Genghis Frog. And you can still kind of see it, but believe it or not, toothpaste takes it off. If you scrub toothpaste against Sharpie on action figures, it, it will take it off which is actually really weird. I never would have guessed that would be true, but it works. But yeah, Genghis Frog was a cool figure, and uh, eventually we would get one more of the punk frogs, but we never actually got all of them. There was four of them in the cartoon. We had Genghis Frog, Napoleon Bonafrog, Rasputin the Mad Frog, and Attila the Frog, and we never got all of them. So that, that kind of stinks, but... I can understand they didn't want to just overload the line with a bunch of frogs because they had all these other interesting animals to tackle. So I appreciate that at least. But I will say he is one of the hardest figures to get standing. He and Ace Duck actually are very hard to get in a good standing pose. They are just built so oddly. Their feet are so odd. And the worst problem with both of them, I have to say, is their belts. They did not get the belt down yet. I feel like Rat King was about the figure that they figured the belts out on. Like, his belt is more like what belts would later be. But by the time you get to Slash, the belts are, like, perfect. That's exactly the way they should be. Just one little plug. It fits in perfectly. It's not that hard to put together. It fits the, the figure. One size fits it. But with Ace Duck and Genghis Frog, they have 
all these little holes on this belt. The belt is very simple. It's kind of a bit of a, a, a harder plastic. It's not as soft as the later ones, but the peg is extremely soft. And it's like soft and fat and it just mushes around and it doesn't get into these holes. And you're supposed to tighten it. But it's like, well, you made the figure. Why didn't you just make a belt that fit the figure? And it's weird because the belts on, you know, the Turtles and on Splinter and Shredder, they, they worked good. They did what they had to do. But for some reason, these belts, they just didn't know what they were doing. And it's like, it's seriously like almost impossible to get these belts on. It's so frustrating. It can even take you over a half an hour of just fidgeting with this thing and driving yourself crazy and getting angry. Like you want to smash these figures at some point. You get so mad trying to get these belts on. And then you finally get them on and they just pop apart the next second. And they don't even look good because they made them too big for the figure. So they just have like all this extra belt sort of hanging out of it. So it's just, it's really stupid. I know there was a limited release of Genghis Frog, which is much rarer if you get him sealed. It's a big deal now where he has a belt colored like Ace Ducks where it's sort of that greenish gold color. But I've always had the black belt ones, I believe. But yeah, those belts are such a problem. The only thing I can assume is that they tried to design a belt that you could like swap, you could put it on other characters. So characters with bigger waists, you'd be able to put that belt on. But I think later on in the line, it was smarter just to design the accessories for the toy they come with and not worry as much about mixing and matching stuff and customization. Because while that stuff is cool and it is fun, at the end of the day, you would like the accessories to work properly with the figure they came with. That's more important than it working with the turtles, say. So, all in all, Genghis Frog, Ace Duck, cool figures, but pretty flawed. And last but certainly not least, from the second wave of figures, well, original figures, we'll get to the variants another time of, you know, the turtles and returning characters. But as far as new characters go, last but certainly not least, the second set is Usagi Yojimbo. Well, technically his name is Miyamoto Usagi, a joke off of Miyamoto Musashi. He's from a different comic book series, not connected to Ninja Turtles actually. However, he has cameoed in the Turtles in almost every iteration they've ever had, to the point where he's practically become an honorary Ninja Turtle character. But it was years before I knew he was not connected to Turtles. I always thought he was just an original Ninja Turtle character as a child. They did definitely beef him up, make him look more aggressive and more human in the action figure. I find it weird that he doesn't even have a bunny tail, he doesn't have a cotton tail or anything on the back, he just has like a human butt. For a rabbit, he's a pretty badass figure. He has this really menacing, teeth-clenched face. Like, he just looks like he's out to kick some butt. He's a samurai rabbit who is actually not a mutant, technically. He comes from a world where everybody's an anthropomorphic animal. I mean, his comic series, Usagi Yojimbo, which is the name of the comic. So in the Turtles, it's always some sort of dimensional portal, usually caused by some invention of Donatello's or whatnot, that opens a gateway and allows Usagi to come into our world. Usagi seems to be one of the most popular characters among TMNT fans, I've noticed. Anytime they start bringing back old characters, instantly everyone asks, what about Usagi? Or as I called him as a little kid, Usagi. I didn't know how to pronounce it. I could still be pronouncing it wrong for all I know, I don't speak Japanese, but I'm doing my best. But yeah, everyone always seemed to really like Usagi, and I do like him, I think he's very cool, he's a very classic character, I've never really dived into his actual comic series and checked out like what that's all about, but as far as his appearances in Ninja Turtles, he's always been cool. But I do have to say, I don't quite like him as much as everyone else does. He's still one of the more pretty cool characters compared to some of the other crazy cool characters that are in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've always been less of a fan of characters who are typically made into cartoon characters. Like, you know, cats, dogs, bunnies, mice, foxes. Like, there's these certain animals that everybody anthropomorphizes when they make cartoon characters that even as a little kid, I always found them a little boring. I was always drawn more to like reptile characters or insect characters or sea creature characters. Just, you know, stuff that's a little more outside of the box. 
Not even necessarily trying to be a hipster or anything. I just found those animals cooler. While I love dogs in real life, I find dog cartoon characters usually to be pretty boring. Obviously there's exceptions, but anyway, we're getting off topic. Usagi Ojimbo was actually my figure as a kid, not my brother's. And I remember really liking his color scheme as a kid, especially like the purple pants. For some reason I thought his purple pants looked really cool with the blue. And Usagi, interestingly enough, is the first toy in the TMNT line that I intentionally broke and had to have replaced. Very early on, shortly after I got him, this is when I was really little, I must have been about three years old, my mom would like read us all a story from some book of fairy tales she had, you know, just generic fairy tales like, I'm sure it had like Rapunzel and Rumpelstiltskins and all that kind of stuff in it. And she would read us one and then we'd go to bed. And during the story time I was like playing with Usagi and for whatever reason I think my mom had to like leave the room for something and my dad came in to watch us. And me and my brother were playing with him and we were just suddenly just got one of those reckless streaks where we're like, like it was funny, it was exciting because we're, like, we're going to start trying to break his ears off. Saying we don't want them to break, but like clearly we do. We're like laughing and seeing how much we can beat up the figure before his ears break off. And at some point his ears just snapped and we had this bald Usagi where he looked like a chipmunk all of a sudden. <laughs> um... Then we were upset, we were still laughing, but we were like, oh no, man, we ruined it. So, I don't remember how long it took, but eventually we got another one. And I believe that one's ears actually broke off also, because there was a point where we were playing, this was years later, so we were playing with all of them in like a red wagon, like one of those old radio flyer wagons. And we were like, pretending it was a room, like it was like a, like a place, and all the turtles were inside there. And we had like all these toy animals, and we'd line them all up. I don't know, we were weird kids, so I don't really know. Like, th this is gonna sound weird, but... We had all these toy animals, and we had this cow, and we put the cow in there. And we grabbed Usagi, and we just started slamming him against the wagon next to the cow going, look at the cow, look at the cow. And we were purposely holding him by the body and smashing his ears against the wagon. And I do think eventually the ears broke off. But the really weird thing, honestly, is that his ears were very brittle back then, from what I remember, they broke off very easily. But when I got older, like in 2006, as I've said, I went through a really stupid phase in 2006, like destructive phase. And one time I kind of acted the way I did when I was a little kid, like, oh, it'd be funny if I tried to break his ears off. And I'm so glad I didn't, because it's like, dude, grow the hell up, what are you doing? This thing's out of production for 20 years, like, treat it with care, you dumbass. But I was, like, trying to, but I, for the life of me, could not. It was so flexible and so strong, the plastic, I couldn't do anything to it. It was so strong. Usually it's the opposite. Usually plastic starts off very flexible and strong and absorbent and then over time gets dried out and more brittle and snaps easily. So I wonder if some Usagis were just built better than other ones with different materials, different plastic, maybe a re-release at some point, or maybe just somehow the way they made the plastic, it got more bendy over time. But Usagi was a cool figure. He was the first samurai figure, I believe, where they added those little plates on him, that sort of padding that they put on all their samurai figures, you know, on the shoulders and everything, and on the thighs they would put them on. And many people would lose these, because they could pop off very easily, and then you'd just have an Usagi who had holes in him. And so there was a lot of ways Usagi could get wrecked, but he was a cool toy. He came with more like standard accessories. They were similar to the the ones that the Turtles and Shredder came with, same color. It seemed like that was a thing at first. They wanted all ninja and samurai characters to come with those brown wooden accessories. But yeah, Usagi's very cool, but I just, I'm not as huge an Usagi fan as most other people are. I think he's just an average cool figure. So I love this wave. It's very important to me personally. This was one of the main things that made me so into Turtles as a kid. These are all classic characters. Every Turtle fan loves these characters. But in hindsight, while it's still an amazing wave of figures, I think the figures would get a little bit better just after this wave. So this one seems a little lacking. Some of the figures are a little mediocre. 
and the sculpts just were getting there, but they weren't quite as awesome as they get. But it's still an awesome wave, so let's rank these guys and see which one's the best and which one's the worst. It's really hard to decide with this wave, honestly, because I don't really hate any of the figures. Well, other than probably one of them. But I don't, like, love, love any of the figures. I do love them all. Like I said, they're extremely nostalgic for me, but none of them are, like, my top favorite figures in the wave. So I'd say maybe at number one, just because all the awesome sculpted detail in him, general drag. He just has a lot of cool detail. I really like the sculpt. Number two, probably just because of back metal, and all because of the cool action features built into the toy, I'd say Metalhead. He's a pretty awesome figure. Number three is a really hard choice. It's either between Rat King or Baxter Stockman. I'd say Rat King's figures is a little bit cooler, so let's give Rat King the number three spot, and Baxter Stockman can have number four. Then it gets really hard to decide, because we have three characters who are very cool, all around the same quality, I believe. I think I like all the figures almost just as much. We're talking Ace Duck, Usagi Yojimbo, and Genghis Frog. But if I had to choose a favorite between the three of them, this could change at any time you ask me, but right now I feel like Genghis Frog, number five. I really can't tell between Usagi and Ace Duck. They're both really cool figures. I think I'm just gonna go Usagi Yojimbo in this case because Ace Duck's accessories are really kind of a nightmare. So, Usagi number six, Ace Duck number seven. Then I'd say number eight would go to Casey Jones. Cool figure, but I think it could have just been a little bit cooler. Then I'd say number nine goes to Krang. There's really not many ways they could have made this a cooler figure. It's a good effort, I like it, but it leaves a little to be desired. And then number 10 is Leatherhead. That's just such a disappointing figure. I still don't know what they were thinking, so. Yeah. Sorry, you're at the very bottom leatherhead. So yeah, that's the whole wave of 1989 figures, the second wave of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Next time, we're going to talk about my favorite wave in the entire line, the third wave that came out in 1990. So many of my favorite figures, just the largest set by far, and I feel the one that just best defines what I think of when I think of the vintage toy line for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. See you next time, guys. Yeah.